discuss the notion of covariant differentiation. And right at the end of the last class, we, we discussed the notion of a Lie derivative. Uh, a derivative that tells you how uh, any quantity with a, with, with a certain index structure changes under infinitesimal coordinate changes. Um, any questions or comments about any things we discussed, any of the things we discussed in the previous class? Yes? Yes. Yes. But for that, don't you need the eigenvalues of the network to be pretty popular and all of that? Yeah, it's true. It's true. Make it, uh, it's true. It's true that you need certain 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 uh, mild conditions on the metric, like like the one that you're talking about. Yeah, uh, it's true. This is this this the, 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 the number of eigenvalues of the metric is called the signature of the metric. Okay, and uh, it's true that this is only possible if you have the correct signature. So that's right. I should have mentioned that as one of the conditions. Any other questions or comments? Excellent. So uh, today we're now going to turn to a fundamental question of um, curved space geometry. And the question is this. You see, when we, were when we started our class, we started talking about flat space, working in some funny coordinate system. And uh, we found that we got something like a metric. Okay, The line element was ds squared, which you could write as, as a metric times delta xi, delta xj. However, as we've emphasized many times during this course, that's not the most general metric, because that's determined by four functions. The most general metric is determined by 10 functions. Now, in a situation where you can make a coordinate change so that the metric goes back to flat space, you know that you're actually dealing with a flat space. However, actually making coordinate changes, suppose I give you a metric looks very complicated. To, to actually make a coordinate change, to go back to flat space, even if that's possible, is not always an easy job. Okay? And uh, the whole spirit of everything we're doing is that we shouldn't have to depend on particular coordinates to answer questions of ph about physics. So the so question we're going to ask now is the following. We're going to ask the question, how can we more invariantly, without working in a particular coordinate system or without changing to a particular coordinate system, tell whether the space we're working in is flat or not? Or how can we more invariantly characterize the deviation of space, fr space from flatness? Okay? And so in order to answer that question, we're going to do the following. Imagine we've got some, some space, and I've given you the metric. There's g mu nu, dx mu, dx mu. Now, what I want to do, what I want to do is to um, examine a little neighborhood of that, 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 that space and try to see if I can tell the difference between it being flat or not. Okay? Now, the intuition I'm going to use is the following. Suppose you were on the, uh, you were on the surface of a sphere and you tried any notion of parallel transport of vectors. Okay? Um, if you think about it, for instance, even without having a very clear de definition, um, even without having a very clear definition, suppose, suppose I gave you a vector at the north pole of a sphere. It was pointing in some direction, and uh, I draw a great circle orthogonal to that direction. You understand what I mean? It's like this. And then I ask you, how does this vector transport parallel to that great circle? It's certainly true from our definitions, but it's quite intuitive that this thing will just transport like this. So it'd go to the equator, sort of pointing in the <coughs> same direction that it started out in. Now suppose you take this vector and you parallelly transport it along the equator. Again, it's true according to our definitions. And maybe we'll have a problem set up. Uh, we'll have an assignment on this. But um, it's sort of intuitive that it'll just st stick along the equator as you move along. Now we parallel transport this back along the great circle, back to the north pole. We choose the great circle that is orthogonal to this vector, so it'll remain orthogonal. So you see, we started out with a vector here in the north pole. We did this parallel transport. We did that. And we come back like this. So what's the net result? The net result is that a sequence of parallel transports that take a vector 
from a point along a curve back to the same point has resulted in a vector that wasn't parallel to the vector we started with. That is entirely impossible in flat space. In flat space, let's say you've got a flat two plane, take a vector, you parallelly transport it here, it remains parallel here, comes back, remains parallel. Okay? So we're going to use this idea, this idea that parallel transport along a closed loop can change whether in a, in a curved manifold, can change whether the vector you know, comes back to what we started with or not to try to characterize the deviation of a space from flat space. That's the rough intuition. Is this clear? Excellent. So let's, let's start out this way. So we've got this metric. Let's take any two coordinates. Let's call these coordinates x1 and x2. So we special single out the coordinates x1 and x2. Okay? Suppose I've got a one-form field, field with one index lower, a mu. Okay? Now I'd, I've got it this at a point, let's say x, and I draw a little square like this. This little square is in the x1 and x2 direction and goes the extent delta x1 this way and delta x2 this way. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is to take this little vector, oh, delta x1 and delta x2 are infinite. I'm going to take this little one form and parallelly transport it first here, 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 and here and see what I get. Okay? Right. So first let us remember the, the formula for parallel transport of a little one form field. So we had delta A mu. Okay? So delta A mu is equal to gamma mu. Uh, delta A mu is equal to mu uh, let's say, let's say theta mu alpha a alpha delta x theta. You might remember that the formula for parallel transport of an upper index had a minus sign, which is why the covariant derivative of an upper index had a plus sign. Okay? So the, the, uh, the formula for parallel transport of a lower index has a plus sign. And then, you know, there are not too many options. Okay? So, fine. So, what we've got to do is to take this guy and parallelly transport it from here to here. Okay? So, this was equal to gamma theta mu alpha. So, this is the first step. So, now I'm going to write down what I get uh, for the vector at this point. So, at this point, what we have is A mu plus gamma theta mu alpha a alpha of x sorry no it's a plus one form field so the no just the, the change under parallel transport okay so we have we have this object we've got a mu um, a mu gamma theta mu alpha and uh, let's put this at x. It really should be integrating over. We'll see. We'll, we'll do this crudely first and then do a bit more sophisticated. Okay. Uh, and a of, a of x. Is this clear? Thank you. Del x theta. Del x theta. Uh, in our situation, this del x theta for this first one will be only del x1. I'm going to write this as del x theta, but we'll remember it's just del x1. Okay. When we go up here, okay, now we get another change here. What is this other change? This other change uses the same kind of formula, but it acts on this object, this whole object. Right, because the starting A was this object. Okay, so it acts on this whole object and takes you up there. So here what will we get? We'll get A mu plus gamma. So this is, let's call it 
A, B, C, uh, let's call it, uh, let's say that this is point zero, this is point one, this is point two, point three. So at point zero, let's write, be a little more systematic. So at point zero, we had A mu of X. <coughs> now at point one, we have this object. What about at point two? So at point two, we had what we started with, which is theta mu alpha of x, a alpha of x, delta t x of theta, and then plus the extra part we get. Okay. Um, here, theta is equal to one. Okay. Plus the extra part we get. Now, what's the extra part we get? The extra part we get is plus gamma phi mu beta, and then this whole object here. A beta, what? <coughs> Same term, but A is this whole thing. But we're going to be working to second order. Okay. okay, so that's going to be very important. So uh, for the second, uh, uh, for the second term, for the uh, gamma beta uh, phi mu term, it should be evaluated at x plus delta. X. Exactly. 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 Let me write that down. Gamma of x plus delta x one plus this guy. How do we write that? We want only delta x in the one direction. I'm just going to write this as delta x1. You'll understand what I mean, right? It's this, this point. This gamma is evaluated here. OK? Times a mu of x plus gamma of uh, theta alpha mu. Now, this was a beta, sorry. A beta beta of x, a alpha of x, delta theta, delta x theta. Remember, theta is always 1. OK, now this is phi here, and there's a delta x. And phi is always 2. OK, so this delta x theta is just in the one direction. Delta x phi is just in the two directions. Now I want to go back. OK, so let's see what I get at 3. OK, so, so, so let's see what I get at 3. Um, what I get at 3 is this whole thing. So let me just write it this way, a at 2. At 2, now with a minus, because my delta x theta now is negative. Okay, so minus gamma at the point 2. So this, I'm going to write it as x plus delta x1 plus delta x2 schematically. Okay. Um, Okay, let me just, let's say this is alpha mu uh, theta delta uh, x theta that should be here, x theta and a mu 2, a alpha 2. OK? Now, you might think that we've got everything that we want, except we have to go back down. The whole point is to judge whether, when we go all around, we get back to what we started with or not. OK? So finally, we get 4, okay, which is <coughs> a mu at 3 minus the same formula, right? 
gamma alpha uh, mu phi uh, x plus delta x2 delta x phi a alpha 3. Okay? What we want to do is to check what the difference between A1 and A4 is. A1 and A4 now are buckets. A0 and A4. What? A0 and A4. A0 and A4, exactly. What we want to do is to check whether, what the difference between A0 and A4 is. Okay. Now, first, let's look at first order terms. Okay? It's suppose we were just to stop everything at first order. Okay? Then, all gammas would be e evaluated at the same point. Because gamma of x and gamma of x plus delta x differs only by, a, by an infinitesimal. Gamma is always multiplying some delta x. Okay, so we don't need to keep track of that. So if we were going to do just first order terms, you can see very easily that all of these, in all of these formulas, a2, a3, a1, and that's just all a0. Right, because everything's already multiplying delta x. Moreover, the gamma is always gamma evaluated at x equals x0. Okay? And then you see that the change in this direction cancels the change in this direction. Can you see? It's just one is plus, uh, minus of the other. Is this clear to everyone? Right? At first order, there is no change. The interesting question is what happens at second order. Okay, the interesting question is what happens at second order. So, now we have to keep track of all the second order bases. So, now there are two kinds of second order pieces. The two kinds of second order pieces are because we've got gamma acting on gamma. That's one thing, so product of two gammas. And the second kind of second order pieces is because Gammas at x are not quite gammas at x plus delta x. Okay? So now it's a little exercise to evaluate this whole thing, uh, keeping all second order pieces carefully. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go. Th shall we go through this exercise or shall I give you the answer? Let's, let's go through the exercise. Let's go through the exercise. Okay, so let's carefully keep all second order pieces. All pieces up to second order. Okay. So let's see. So at the point x1, what we had was just this first order shift. Okay. Let's say that our base gamma is gamma at x. Any gamma at any other point will be expanded in Taylor series in terms of gamma at x. Okay? So this quantity here was just purely first order. Okay. Now what about the guy at, uh, at x2? Okay? So at x2, what do we have? We have whatever we have at first order. So at, at x2, at 2 we have... Um, first order plus the second order pieces. One of the second order pieces is the product of this gamma times this gamma. That pro for that product, we ignore the delta x. Okay? So that part is gamma phi beta mu gamma Theta, beta, alpha, A alpha x, uh, delta x theta, delta x phi. That's great. Now this second order piece will not trans will not participate in any further addition. It will just go along for the ride. Because if you parallel transport this guy, that gives you something third order. Okay, so this we just keep. Keep in mind and add up. Is this clear? 
So this is the first piece that we're going to have to add. Now, for the second piece, we need the second order part going from here to here. That second order part needs just the parallel transport of the first order vector at two. Is this clear? What was the first order vector at two? That is very simple because at the first order vector at two was a mu at x plus gamma mu theta uh, alpha a alpha delta x theta plus gamma mu phi alpha a alpha delta x phi. Right? Because we're just keeping to first order for this. It's just some of these two first order changes. Okay? So now on this, we have to do the third parallel transport. The, the parallel transport that does this. So what is the change that we get from here? We get the change by acting minus, and now we're supposed to make this alpha, so I'll call that beta. Minus gamma mu theta beta x plus uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's one more piece here that I forgot. I'm sorry. I should have. In this part, we also needed the fact that this guy was not quite gamma, but was gamma at x plus delta x. OK? So wh what is that? That part is plus. Delta x theta, del theta, gamma beta phi mu times a beta. And delta x phi. So these are the two things that we have to keep and sum up. Okay, great. Um, now here what we have. Here what we have is x gamma of x plus delta x1 plus delta x2. Acting on this guy and then going backwards. That's the minus thing. So this times delta x theta times del times a alpha 2. Once we get the answer, we will, there's a much more elegant way to do it. That elegant way is a bit confusing. Okay. So <laughs> I wanted to show this to you really explicitly. So there's no doubt. Then we look at the more elegant. You know, we'll, we'll, Landau Lipschitz has a very elegant, as always, way. <laughs> of understanding it, but I find it useful to once do it straight and then look at the elegant things. Okay, so it's very clumsy, but it's you know kind of get off your own. Okay, so uh, what do we have? We've got this business here. So now what wh what is this business? One term once again is a product of terms. Okay, one term once again is a product of this gamma times this gamma times these gammas, okay? And the other term is derivatives acting on, on A, okay? So let's keep both of them uh, let's keep both of them. So we've got this box which we'll just keep as is We've got a second box, okay, which is one term which is minus gamma beta mu theta uh, gamma alpha beta theta
that a alpha delta x. OK, now we write this as theta prime theta. Uh, they both, theta and theta prime are both just in the one direction. X theta and uh, this one is also an x. Yeah, so that's delta x theta prime delta x theta. Do you understand, understand what I mean? Theta prime and theta both dummy variables, but representing motion along the one direction. So if you want, I could just make this, if you find it more less confusing, every time I see either a theta prime or a theta, I can just replace it by one. Is this clear? OK, so this is same as 1, 1, delta x1, delta x1. OK, great. OK, so that's one term. That's this times this. And then there is this term here, which is minus gamma. Mm. Beta mu theta uh, gamma mm, alpha beta phi a alpha delta x phi delta x theta uh, sorry two alphas here. Uh, where did we go? This e two alpha was, was that, right? Yeah, that part we did okay. Sorry about this, I, I'll hurry it up, sorry. Uh, delta x theta, uh, delta x theta. Please check anything I've got wrong here. Hmm. OK, that's the stuff from the, um, uh, that's the stuff from the, uh, um, uh, that's the stuff from the, uh, uh, um, uh, from the product of gammas. OK, that's the stuff from the product of gammas. And then there is the stuff from, uh, from the derivatives. OK, so I have to. Uh, open out this derivative, so I get okay minus uh, del delta x theta prime del theta prime gamma mu theta beta mm. x uh, a beta delta x x phi delta x uh, theta prime. Is this okay? Okay, and minus delta x uh, phi prime del phi prime a beta delta x mm, uh, delta x. Uh, Phi, right? Theta, 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 theta. This was delta x theta. Yes. Theta. And here, this was also theta. Thank you. <laughs> OK. So, that, so we've got this guy. We've got this guy. And we just, just one more. And we need the change when we're going from 3 to 0. Okay, just that guy and we're done. 
So what's that guy? OK. That guy is this thing. So here, where were we? Here we were. We, we, the first order change was parallel transport here, parallel transport up, parallel transport back there. These two cancel each other at first order. So it's just parallel transport up. Right? So A mu plus delta x phi um, gamma phi uh, mu alpha A alpha. This is what A was at first order at point three. And now it has to be taken down. Okay. So we will take this, let's call it beta, and we will multiply it by minus gamma mu um, beta phi prime delta x phi prime. Okay, we want the second order piece in that. And this is evaluated at x plus delta x2. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so now what are we going to get? Here we get, again, two terms. We get the product of gamma, so let's keep another box. Yeah. Uh, if we keep another box, what do we get? We get minus gamma beta mu phi prime. gamma alpha phi beta A alpha delta x phi phi delta x phi prime phi phi prime. Okay. And finally, one last term, which is from this derivative here. Okay. And the last term from the derivative here is uh, um, the last term from the derivative here is the following. It is um, you know, actually it would have been, everything would have been nicer if had Taylor expanded everything around the middle point. That would have been basically the same. I, I, I agree. You could have done that. But you know, I'm going to get everything expanded around this, which is not, I should have expanded both A and anywhere. Mm. What are uh, we're going to get the curvature, but not evaluated at the point, but a little, little displaced. I did it stupidly. Let, let's, let's deal with what we have. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, w w what is the uh, derivative here? This is minus delta x phi prime, del phi prime. No, this is already a phi prime. All right, I'll call it a phi. Phi gamma mu phi prime beta. Uh, gamma mu phi prime beta times A beta. Delta x phi delta x phi prime. Fantastic. Thank you.
OK. OK, excellent. OK, now all we have to do is to sum all the terms in the various boxes. So there was this guy, there was this guy, and there was this guy. We need to sum those terms. OK, now there are two kinds of terms. There are terms when, in which we've got delta x theta, delta x theta prime, or delta x phi, delta x phi prime, and we've got uh, terms in which we've got a delta x theta, delta x phi. Let's first look at the terms in which we've got a delta x theta, delta x phi. OK, so let's use some color chalk and circle those terms. This is such a term. This is such a term. Here, this is such a term. And this is such a term. And that's it, right? Oh, uh, and here we had phi phi prime. We just had four terms with x theta, x phi. Let's, let's organize them together. Let's collect them together. OK, so let's collect them carefully. Mm. Let's first get the product of gamma terms. So everything multiplies, and let's choose our conventions. Let's choose that everything multiplies a alpha, delta x theta, delta x phi. A alpha delta x theta delta x phi. Okay. The first term here is gamma beta phi mu gamma alpha. What was this? Theta, yes. <coughs> theta beta. Then there is the other place where we have product of gammas is here. Okay, so we get a minus. Once again, we've got a alpha, a phi, a theta, so that we're good. Uh, gamma beta mu theta, gamma alpha beta phi. And then, in addition to this, so this is all multiplying all of this. Okay. In addition to this, we've got the terms with derivatives on gammas. So the first such term is here. There should have been an A beta here. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, no, A beta That was A beta. Thank you. So you want me to change beta to alpha. Thank you. So that's plus del theta gamma alpha phi mu. Uh, that's it, right? And what about the last term here, which was this term? Again, you want me to change this to alpha. And so I get minus del phi Prime. Thank you. Del phi. So you want me to change this to phi. Del phi, gamma mu theta alpha. Okay. Let me check now against Landau Lipschitz to see if I've got this right. Uh, Okay, so firstly we've got theta phi and e alpha. So his LM. Just one moment. We've got LM. So theta phi good. Minus theta phi. That, that's good. And we've got just one minute. Uh, 
L M L M and K L M K L M Let's pick up phi mu B now one contraction and uh, by one contraction yeah 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 I think I think I think it's right okay I've ch checked the relative sign between here and here only to 90 percent accuracy <laughs> I think this is right okay so this quantity here, I'll just make sure we get the sign, the overall sign right now, has a name. Okay, this quantity here, see wh what is it? See it has, how many indices does it have firstly? Exactly, it has four indices. What are these indices? You're going to, the indices are theta, phi, alpha and mu. Mu is the free index, yes. Yes. Correct. And there is a del x phi del x theta is one to class. I didn't understand. Say, say again what the, the problem here, is. Here, del x theta and del x phi is one to class. No, no, no. <laughs> See, it's very important that you don't think of this as an as summation. Okay. What was del x theta? It was just one. Okay. So this is del x1, del x2. Do you understand? Okay. I'm using funny notation in this lecture so far. This theta and phi are not summed over all in. It's just del x theta is a particular vector. So, you know, if I'd been a mathematician, I would have, and maybe I should have done that even if I was not a mathematician, I should have called this guy tilde and this guy tilde quid line. There are two different vectors with which you're contracting. Yeah. Now then, these are dummy indices. But because these are different vectors, it's all okay. Do you understand? Okay, I'm sorry for the, for that confusion. So can you speed up the weight product of uh, this? Uh, well, you, you, uh, you see, it's a bit dangerous to do that since gammas are not tensors. They're not themselves forms. Okay, I don't think one should try to, because, yeah. Um, fine. So let me get the overall. So firstly, how many indices do we have? We have four indices. The four indices were mu, the free index, and these three indices here. How many of these indices were lower? Three of them, okay? Mu was lower, and theta and phi were lower because they're contracting with upper indices. How many were upper? One of them, because it's contracting with, the lower, uh, with, a, with an upper index. Okay, so we're gonna do the, make the following defi definition. R, um, okay, I'm just going to copy Landau Lifshitz, and that hopefully is the same as us, which is R I K L M. Let me write it on another line. R I K L M. Now you probably can't distinguish my I from my L. So, uh, Let's, let's, call, let's replace I by N. R N K L N is equal to uh, del by del um, X L gamma N K M minus del by del uh, X M gamma uh, N K L uh, plus gamma of I N L. Ah, uh, so that's N. Oh my God. Uh, alpha L gamma alpha K M minus gamma of uh, 
minus gamma of n uh, alpha m gamma n k l, oh, sorry, alpha. Okay, and with this definition, and with this definition, uh, this change as we go around on in this loop. Uh, should turn out to be delta a k is equal to r n k l m uh, delta x l delta x m. So uh, to be consistent with our notation, we call this theta and phi x theta Times a times a l. Okay, fine. So this was just some irritating, long, boring, crude algebra. Uh, what we've got so far are the terms that were proportional to delta x pi delta x theta. Now we also need the terms proportional to um, uh, we also need the terms proportional to delta x theta squared and delta x phi squared. Okay, I'm going to, these terms are essentially trivial in the sense that they're essentially an artifact of our discretization. They basically move the curvature to a nearby point. I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you guys to figure out. Oh, maybe I should leave, make the exercise more specific. Suppose we did, suppose we had done this whole thing. But Taylor expanded all points, uh, all fields, not about these, not about this point, which was a very anti, a very asymmetric thing to do, but about the middle. Okay, show that in, if you did that, the cross terms would be exactly what we calculated here, but the direct terms would vanish. Okay. Which is another way of saying that any direct terms, any delta theta square terms or delta phi square terms are just an artifact of the fact that we Taylor expanded around a slightly, slightly wrong point. Okay, so maybe this is the best way of wording that exercise. Okay, this is what I should have done. I should have expanded around here. I was careless, I expanded around here. Normally this wouldn't matter by the way. It wouldn't matter if we were doing first order calculations. But the point is we're doing a second order calculation. So because we're doing a second order calculation, we have to be careful about what we, you know, what we're doing. So if we'd extended around a symmetric point, check that those other terms would, have, would vanish. Okay? So I'm gonna leave that for you as an exercise. Okay, so assuming you've carried through this exercise, what we see is the following. What we see is that if we take this little, this little vector and we parallel transport it around this loop, we don't come back quite to ourselves. There is a change in this vector. The change is proportional to a certain tensor. It's proportional to the coordinate area of the little loop that we've gone around. That's what this delta x1, delta x2 business was. Okay? 
it, it was proportional to the coordinate area of the little loop we'd wandered around. And uh, it was proportional to a particular object. Now, you see, this object here, um, this object here has to be a tensor. Why is that the case? This is because the question of how much a vector has changed once you come back to the same point is an entirely physical, un, uh, un uh, uh, parallel transport dependent question. Because now you're comparing two vectors at the same point. Okay? So the question of how much that vector has changed is a question you could ask in any coordinate system. It's a physical question. Okay? And so if you use one set of coordinates, I use another set of coordinates, we must get the same answer if you take your answer and coordinate transform to my answer. So that better turn out if we've done a calculation, if we've done our algebra correctly, that this object here was a tensor. Now this is very interesting because gammas were not tensors. You remember in your last problem set you had a you, ha you worked out the coordinate transformation rules of gammas and you found that there was one term that was ten tensorial and another term that was inhomogeneous. However, if we've done everything correctly, it would be an inconsistency unless this quantity here turned out to be a tensor. Okay? So, so this was exercise one, exercise two is to check that. Check using the coordinate transformation properties of gamma. That R is a tensor. Okay, this tensor has a name. It's called the curvature tensor. Okay, and it has a direct physical interpretation. It tells you if you've got a little, um, it tells you if you've got a little, uh, uh, a little loop in the theta pi direction, you take a one form field around here, how much it changes by according to this form field. Okay. Questions or comments about this object before we proceed? The fact that this thing is a tensor is very important. Why is it important? It's, an, it's important because it means you can calculate in any coordinate system. Now, what is the curvature tensor of flat space? It's zero because we could do the calculation in the metric eta. Okay, look at the formula for this. In the metric eta, gamma was zero, so all its derivatives are zero, so the sort object is zero. But because it's a tensor, if it's zero in one coordinate system, it's zero in every coordinate system. So in flat space, R n k phi theta was just the zero tensor. Okay? So this is an invariant diagnostic of whether space is curved or not. Okay? If any of the components of R n k pi theta are non-zero, okay, then you immediately know, then you immediately know that your space is, uh, uh, then you immediately know that your, your space is, um, is not flat. In fact, there is a converse theorem that we will prove maybe at the end of this lecture, maybe at the beginning of the next one, which is that if you've got a space time, in which, in a whole open set, R is everywhere zero, or R is everywhere zero, then that space time is flat. Uh, we'll prove this very soon. Okay? So this is a complete diagnostic that helps you distinguish between flat space and curved space. And it's more than that. You see, it's not just that you get something non-zero or zero, you get a number, you get values, right? You've got a whole tensor which has some values. Now, tensors um, are not coordinate invariant. 
But out of tensors, you can easily make coordinate invariant objects. For instance, um, you can take this object, multiply it with, by another such object, and contract all indices. Or you can take this object and contract indices in pairs. We're going to study that basically now. Okay? All these things then are scalars. Scalars at any given point on the space-time manifold have a coordinate invariant meaning. Okay? So there are there, and you can do many more things. You can take various derivatives of this. You can take an in, a arbitrary number of covariant derivatives of this object. Get an object with many more indices and then contract away indices. So there are zillions of ways of getting scalars out of this object. All of these scalars are invariant characterizations of the curvature of the space and characterized not just by whether something is zero or not, but giving, giving you an actual number field. So it's a quantitative characterization of how curved space-time is. Okay? Great. Now, uh, there are two or three other algebraic exercises that we have to do. I'm sorry, this, much of this class is going to be algebra. Okay. I'm sorry about that. It's very tempting to ask you to do it yourself, but let me, let me do a few of these things. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, there are two or three other algebraic exercises we have to do before we get to the fun stuff. Oh. But in the next class, I promise, we'll get, we'll get to Einstein's equations. The next question we're going to ask is this. You see, um, I've already told you that this curvature tensor tells us what happens if you parallel transport along this loop. Now there is something else that you could, given a one-form field, there's something else that you could do that reminds you of this procedure. In fact, if you think about it hard, it's basically the same procedure, which is this. Given a one-form field A mu, one could take derivatives of it in two different ways. One could, one could take an alpha beta derivative of it. Let me, let's call it theta phi. Since that's what we were doing. We can take a theta phi derivative. Or we could take a phi theta derivative. Okay, and we can ask the question: What is the what is the connection between these two things? I'm now going to show you that the difference between these two things is also captured by the curvature tensor. If you think about it, it's not. You can try to think of a logical reason that this is the, this is the case. It's not too different from what we did actually. Okay. However, I'm just going to just do I'm just going to do algebra to try to show this to you. Okay. So it's painful algebra. So buckle your seatbelts. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. Firstly, we're going to use the fact that everything we're computing here are tensors. This guy's a tensor, and this guy's a tensor. Because they're tensors, we can, we can do the computation in any coordinate system. And once we get a result, covariantize it. Okay? So, to make life as, uh, as uh, simple as possible, to make life as simple as possible, I'm going to choose to work in a coordinate system in which gamma is equal to zero. Because you guys have already in your problem set shown me that it's always possible to find such a coordinate system. I'm going to believe your results <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, and use it. Okay? Now, gamma is equal to zero, that's great. But let me emphasize that your problem set uh, showed that it was always possible to find a coordinate system in which gamma was equal to zero, but not a neighborhood in which gamma was equal to zero. If there's a neighborhood in which gamma is equal to zero, that's only possible in flat space. Okay? It's not in general possible to find a neighborhood in which gamma is zero. 
Okay? So derivatives of gamma at that point will not be zero. But gamma will be zero. So in this coordinate system, gamma is zero, but remember del gamma not equal to zero. Okay? Now with this in mind, what we're going to do is to write down what the definition of each of these quantities is and just calculate. So let's look at the left hand side. So this is del theta of, now what was this? This guy was del phi of a mu minus gamma phi alpha um, a alpha and we wanted del phi a mu is a mu. Okay, good. Then we want to compute this object, this covariant. I'm not going to at this point set gamma equals zero because that's dangerous. It's dangerous because this del theta here includes a derivative. But the, exactly, I can set gamma equal to zero for everything except the purposes of taking derivatives. So let's immediately, so this gamma theta here has three terms. One is a derivative of this whole object. And then there are two gamma terms because it acts on a two index object. Okay, but for the purposes of the second, the second thing that is acting with the two gamma terms, for the purpose of that we can act only on this object. Do you understand? So for the purpose of taking the derivative, we have to keep this. Okay, but for the purpose of taking, uh, acting with the two gamma objects, we can ignore it. Okay, so let's write out all terms, keeping that in mind. First, let's take the derivatives. So one thing is del theta del phi a mu. Okay, when we have derivative of this acting on this, that can we ignore? Yes, because it has a gamma with no derivatives. Oh, the only term in which this is not to be ignored is minus del theta gamma phi mu alpha alpha. That's the full derivative term. Okay? Next, we have the gamma terms. So we have minus gamma theta let's say zeta, and let me take, replace phi. Phi del um, del zeta a uh, mu, and we've got another term. But the point is that this quantity is multiplied by a, by a gamma. So it just gives you zero. So now you see that a calculation which would have been a horrible calculation in a general coordinate system actually gives you how many terms? Just two terms. Because the only thing that was non-zero was when the derivative hit the gamma. This is often a very useful trick. When you've got a terrible calculation to do, go to a coordinate system which makes it make the calculation simple. But of course you have to do it right. Okay, so this thing which was some horrible thing is actually just, just this. So this whole thing in this coordinate system is this. What about this quantity? Well, we've got symmetry. We just replace theta by phi and phi by theta. So we get minus del phi del theta a mu minus del, yes, thank you minus del phi gamma alpha theta mu a alpha. Now this and this cancel each other because derivatives are an object, it doesn't matter which order you take them. So what's left is minus del theta gamma alpha phi mu plus 
Delphi gamma alpha theta mu into A alpha. Is this clear? Now, what we need to do is to look up our definition. See, this quantity is correct only in this particular coordinate system. But if we can identify this quantity as a tensor evaluated in this coordinate system, then replace it by the tensor, then that result will be true in every coordinate system. But look, this is the expression for R, the tensor R, in a coordinate system in which gamma is zero. Because the tensor R contains two terms which are derivative of gamma minus each other, and two terms which are product of gamma. But in the coordinate system in which gamma is zero, those product terms are zero. So in this particular coordinate system, this is basically the tensor R. Okay? And uh, uh, if you are careful about, uh, if you are careful about um, KL. Now, let me see how he does this. He first takes k and then l. So, so I'll tell you what we should. Okay, maybe somebody can, somebody who has has the definition of r, can tell me what what indices I should put here. Okay, theta phi alpha mu a alpha up to a minus. Yeah. There's a minus n. Phi theta. Theta minus n. Oh, it's the minus n without? Okay. Theta phi. I, I'm not going to try to get that right. No, now there's a minus n. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Figure it out. Look up ladder. <laughs> okay. This is this in this coordinate system, but then therefore it must be the same in every coordinate system because R is a tensor. Okay? And so we found this marvelous fact that the commutation, okay, that the commutation of derivatives, okay, that the commutation of derivatives. Um, Derivatives don't, covariant derivatives, unlike ordinary derivatives, do not in general commute. The lack of commutativity of derivatives, however, is not arbitrary. It's given in terms of geometrical data of the manifold, and in particular in terms of this curvature tensor. Is this clear? Okay. Now, What I want you to do in your next exercise is to generalize this formula to the action of covariant derivatives on a tensor of arbitrary index structure. Okay? You see that if you use this method of calculation, it's very easy. You can probably see in your head how it's going to work. You see, because the only way that you get something non-zero is when the derivative acts on a gamma. You see that that happens index by index. So basically what's going to happen is that there's going to be one such formula for all lower, or lower indices. A similar formula for all upper indices. So basically these two will get interchanged. And then it will act index by index. Okay? But I'm going to leave you to I'm going to leave you to work that out carefully and to uh, present a formula. Generalize to thing will come with one, each thing will be replaced by an R. Okay. Is that confusing? Shall we do one example? 
Okay, let's let's do an example with what would you like? Two lower indices or one lower, one upper? No, not this problem. I am saying that from these two terms, uh -huh. how you are figure out the cross terms of the. Ah, term. how did you figure it? Sorry, this is very important. You see, in this see in this coordinate system, this is true, and this is also true. Why? Because in the coordinate system, gamma is zero. So r is simply equal to this because the cross terms are 0. Both are correct formulas. In this coordinate system, this is a correct formula and this is a correct formula. Now the question is which form do you want to write it in? If you chose to write it in this form, you would be correct, but you would learn nothing. Why would you learn nothing? Because this object is not a tensor. So know that it was this in this coordinate system would not help you figure out what it would be in an arbitrary coordinate system. No, it's uh, yeah, it's simpler than that. Okay. You see, this quantity is this quantity okay. in this coordinate system. But now that it's, if we write it in this form, this is true that it's equal to this. Because this is a tensor, this equation must be true in every coordinate system because the left hand side was a tensor. So that's it. You see, when you do the coordinate transformation, the product of gamma terms must appear. Yeah. Yeah. Because only that quantity was the tensor. Mm -hmm. Is this clear? This is very important. I, is it totally clear? Yes. Excellent. Is this exercise? No, it's fine. It's fine? Okay, excellent. Um, excellent. So we are happy. So obtain the formula for uh, del theta del phi minus del phi del theta acting on an arbitrary tensor. Um, by the way, uh, can somebody immediately tell me what del theta del phi minus del phi del theta will be acting on a scalar? Zero. Because the first guy had no gammas, so there was nothing to differentiate. Uh, this is simple enough so you could do the calculation in an arbitrary coordinate system. Okay, the first guy is just del nu. The second guy has a gamma, but you'll see that the, the gamma that appears is symmetric. So under the anti-symmetrization, it just goes off. Okay, great. Good, so we're making progress. We've understood that there are two separate connected uses for this uh, for this uh, uh, curvature tensor. The first one is to uh, look at commu what the difference between orders of derivatives are. Uh, the second is parallel transport. These are not independent, they're the same thing in some, some sense, uh, but okay. By the way, for those of you who are familiar with uh, gauge theories, uh, you, 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 you probably know of this thing called the gauge covariant derivative. You probably also know that gauge covariant derivatives don't commute. But the lack of commutativity of a gauge covariant derivative is in terms of the field strength of the underlying gauge field. Okay? Uh, there is a close analog here. There is a sense in which R mu nu alpha beta is like the field strength. Okay? For something like general coordinate transformations. Actually, more precisely for these local Lorentz rotations. We'll discuss this as we go along. Okay, so, so general relativity is sort of like a non-abelian gauge theory. There's some sense in which that's true. And we will see as, as we go along in, in a Well, the commutator of covariant derivatives doesn't vanish, but let's see. Um, suppose we have something acting on, uh, yeah, it, uh, you're, you're right, it, it, it doesn't vanish. In non evident case theories, the commutator is not gauge invariant. In terms of uh, evaluation, that's gauge invariant. Uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't vanish when acting on something charged. Okay. Uh, 
In this case, however, it would vanish when acting on the gauge field, or on the field strength itself, which is uncharged. Okay? Here, we're getting, we would, for instance, acting on R alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which is something made entirely out of the metric tensor. Still, the commutator of two covariant derivatives doesn't vanish. And R alpha, beta, gamma, delta is made up entirely of the gauge fields of general relativity, namely the metric. So in that sense, general relativity is behaving like a non, like a non abelian gauge theory. Because the com commutator of covariant derivatives is non-vanishing even when acting on things made out of the gauge field itself. I see. Right. The more general, yeah, right. The, the more general, um, as you know, the more general statement is that the commutator of covariant derivatives in, uh, in a non-abelian gauge theory or an abelian gauge theory depends on the representation in which the thing on which it's acting transforms. And the important thing is that in an abelian gauge theory, the f gauge fields themselves, or everything covari uh, covariant, everything gauge invariant built out of the gauge field, is in trivial representations. So it needs some external field on which to act in, an, in a non-trivial way. The fact that it acts in a non-trivial way on the graviton itself is basically the fact that gravity is behaving like a non, okay, a non-abelian theory. Yeah, but good point. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Now let us continue. Um, let us continue with our uh, with our algebraic exercises, <laughs> since you guys like it so much. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, the next thing I want to do is to um, is to explain various basic properties of the curvature tensor. And in order to do that, it's useful to have a slightly modified alternate expression for the curvature tensor. So I'm going to write, I, I'm going to work out that, that expression. I'm cleaning this again. I'm going to work out that expression, and then we'll use it to figure out Bethe's property. OK? So let us first recall the formula we had for the curvature tensor, and then I'll process it. The formula was R n uh, KLM is equal to Okay, first let's get this right. Okay, so this is uh, gamma del L, is L the first one? Yes, del M KM minus del M KL. Okay, and this guy here was what? This guy here was Putting gamma, 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 gamma. The first index up here was always an n, and then um, we have one index contracting always. So we say a a a a, and then it's a question of which one is here and which one is here. Hmm. So in the first one, there is an L, I believe. That's correct. L, and then there's an M. And here there's an M, and then there's an L. Ah, thank you. Yes. <laughs> OK. So that's our formula. Now. This curvature tensor has been written with one index up and three indices down. Notice, by the way, that it's obviously anti-symmetric in these two indices. And you might wonder what its symmetry properties are in the other indices. But that's not even a question you can ask. 
with the which are written tensor written in this form. Uh, because one index is up and the other one is down, you can't interchange them. Up and down indices are different things. However, in any such, such a system with a metric, uh, bringing upper indices down is no big deal. Okay, so let's work with um, let's work with the uh, uh, with the curvature tensor in which I lower this nth index. Okay. Uh, once we work with that object, we'll see more symmetries of this, this object. Um, more symmetries of this object than, uh, than we first see. So let's call this guy P. Let's call this guy P. P, P, and multiply this whole thing by G N P. And this whole thing, by definition, is R N K L M. <coughs> okay. And what I want is uh, an expression for this R N K L M. Now, this part of the expression I'm not going to touch. Okay. This part part of the expression. Um, that's all right. Let's get that. No, no, I'm going to get. Okay, I'm going to first write down what the claim is, and then we'll try to see how we get it. Okay. N K L M. So claim that this quantity is equal to half of N. This is the claim that we can rearrange the expression for this object uh, to this object. Um, now let's see. Um, basically what we have to do in order to take this claim is to plug in what gamma is in terms of g. And process. Can I leave this to you to check? 
let's let's leave this as an exercise. Just a simple, just algebraic. Okay, what do you have to do? We know exactly what gamma is in terms of g. You put that in here and check that you can re-manipulate the expressions to this object. Okay, gamma involves terms with one derivative of g. So there will be some terms with two derivatives of g. Those are these terms. But gamma involves terms with one derivative of g and you know, products of that with various factors of g. So when you take um, uh, when you take derivatives of gamma or when you take products of gamma, there will be some terms with two one derivative products and those will be these terms. So basically one way of organizing this calculation is to first take this object and work out every term with two derivatives of g. Um, okay, And once you've done that, whatever remains will group up into that. Uh, we could do the first part if you like, that's very fast. Uh, anyway, I'll leave it here, right. So it's, it's, it's very simple. The terms with two derivatives of g come only from here and from here. You see that? Okay. From here, there were six terms with g's, uh, with, sorry, there were three terms with derivatives of g's. There was also g inverse. But if you want the terms with two derivatives of g's, you won't have the derivative act on the g inverse. So you'll just go through. So that part's very simple. There will be three terms from here, three terms from here, one and one will cancel, and we'll give you these two terms. That part is like two minutes to work out. Okay? And then this part is a little more, a little more work to get everything else right. Okay, great. Fine. What is the point of this expression here? This expression is a very nice expression because in it you see many things that were not, um, uh, in it you, uh, you see many things. The first thing that you see is just like in LNM, this quantity here is anti-symmetric under interchange of N and K. Let's check. Look, these two terms differ by the relative placement of N and K. So clearly this object picks up a minus sign. What about here? Okay. K and L. K and L, K and L, exactly. So this and this, and this and this, exactly. Okay. So this is, it's just manifest in terms of this expression that this, this curvature tensor here has more symmetry than it first seemed. It was obvious that the tensor was anti-symmetric in the last two indices. For instance, from the fact that it was a commutator. Okay? What was not obvious was that it was anti-symmetric also in the first, the first two indices. That was not obvious in what we did. It couldn't have been because we had one index up, one index down. Okay? But once you get both indices down and you manipulate a little, you see this. Okay. That's great. Then, uh, there is something else that, that, that you can also say. And that is this. Suppose you interchange the pair of indices, Lm and Nk. So what is R Lm Nk? Okay, so what we're supposed to do is where we had N and K, we put L and M. So let's, let's just work it out. Uh, let's work out this term, for instance. This term here, where we had K, we're supposed to substitute M. And where we had uh, L, we're sup supposed to substitute N. So this term would become K went to M and L went to N. Okay? This term here, 
n goes to l and m goes to k. But since gamma is symmetric, this is the same as this. Okay. Notice that alpha and p are just dummy variables that have been contracted with this. So this term went back to itself. Similarly, you check this term goes back to itself. Okay. Look up here. This term had an mn here. Sorry, we have. So let's look at these terms. Uh, okay, so there was a term where the two derivative indices were uh, L uh, first and second. L and M. Just a minute. One, 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 one. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always the case that one derivative index here is one of these two indices and one derivative index here is one of these two indices. Okay? But in, right, exactly. So let's just, let's just do it, as, as somebody said. Suppose I now interchange L with N. So this term will become what? It will become del, del X k has become m, l has become del x n, and this was g n m, it became g l k. And that was the second term, somebody nicely said. Okay, similarly you'll check that these two go into each other. Okay, so just a little inspection that allows you to say that this quantity here is symmetric under, sorry, anti-symmetric in this pair of indices, anti-symmetric in this pair of indices, but symmetric in the interchange of the actual pairs. Okay. Now there's one more identity that we're going to check in a minute, but even before that, let's do some counting. Question, how many independent, at any given point, how many independent components are there in the curvature tensor? Just for fun, let's work in d-dimensions. So suppose we're in a d-dimensional space. Uh, I want somebody to, if there were no, no further properties of curvature tensor, I want somebody to help me count how many independent components there are at the curvature tensor. Any suggestions? Somebody will help me, I'll, I'll help them. D into D minus 1 no. by 2. Plus Excellent. So the formula is D into D minus 1 by 2 into D into D minus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2. That, that's what you were suggesting, right? Excellent. Let's, let's, uh, tell me your name again, please. Pranay. So let's, 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 let's try to understand how Pranay was thinking. Pranay was thinking that this quantity is best regarded as a matrix in two steps. Let us think of this as a matrix in which this is a compound index and this is another compound index. Thought that way, that matrix is a symmetric matrix. But how many values do these compound indices run over? They run over the number of anti-symmetric combinations of D. So this can be thought of as a matrix which is symmetric but whose indices run over as many anti as many objects as you can form out of anti-symmetric combinations of D. But how many objects can you form out of anti-symmetric combinations of D? That's D into D minus 1 by 2. Now, so if you had a symmetric matrix which is n cross n, its number of components is n into n plus 1 by 2. But to use that formula, you need to substitute n is the number of values that the, indice, the compound indices run over, which is D into D minus 1 by 2, which is this. So excellently done. Okay, now uh, uh, let's come back down to earth and let's work this out at d equals four. Okay, here this is the number of anti-symmetric indices in d equals four, which is six into uh, into seven divided by two, which is twenty-one. 
Okay? So if there were no further properties, the number of independent components point-wise uh, of this uh, curvature tensor would be 21. However, there's actually one more point-wise uh, point identity for this curve for this uh, this tensor which is uh, uh, which is the this this which is the statement that it that, that, that this tensor vanishes under um, under a cer certain uh, cyclical sum where is he written this yeah which is this r n k l m plus r n yeah just cyclically so, so m k l plus r n cyclically sum so l m k So what, what is this saying? This is saying keep the first index, but actually because of all the symmetries, it doesn't matter which index. Okay? But let's say keep the first index fixed. Okay? Take the remaining three indices and cyclically sum them. Is this have to do with the Jacobian entropy for the, the covariant derivatives taken as uh, a commutative? Yeah, does this have to be do with the Jacob? No, you see. The Jacobi identity involves derivatives of the field strength. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the an analogous question that you were asking in a gauge theory would be a Jacobi identity which is like del alpha f beta gamma cyclically summed is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the analog of th this quantity is the analog of f itself, not of del f. Okay? There's going to be another identity uh, that is closely analogous to the Jacobi identity. But that will involve derivatives of R. Okay, this is a separate thing. That's a good question. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'll come to that identity in a moment. It'll become clear. Okay. Now, how do we see that this is the case? Well, we just have to use this expression and check. Okay. Uh, Yeah, what, what we want to see is that this, this expression under cyclical sum just gives us zero. Now let's see if we can see that. See, suppose I hold n fixed and I cyclically sum all of these. This is going to cancel against this. Can you see this? Okay, I hold n fixed. I cyclically sum over these. This will cancel over against this. Is that clear? Okay, similarly, if I hold n fixed, uh, these two terms cancel against each other. Right, because this, these are just cyclical permutations of these. Okay, so two minutes of looking at this expression will convince you that this, this, exp that this object is, that this thing is true. Okay? So in addition to in addition to the symmetry and anti-symmetry properties of R, there is this one additional trace, I mean cyclical sum type, uh, cyclical sum type, uh, cyclical sum type identity, uh, which uh, further reduces the number of components of R. Okay. Exercise. Okay, tell me, compute. Without this identity, we've checked that the number of independent components was 21, let's say in four dimensions. Okay, compute the number of independent.
for taking account, taking into account the cyclical sum. Okay, we'll discuss it in the next when you submit your ex exercise. It's a, it's a simple thing to do, but interesting. Okay. Um, maybe yeah, one more exercise. Uh, do the same. Tell me, in a two and three dimensional space, how many independent components there are point wise in the curvature? Tensor? What is it? Uh, that time? Work it out, yes. <laughs> okay. In, it depends on how long. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Uh, okay. Um, fine. I think, oh, wait, lower time. Um, I think that's, that's it for the basic algebraic stuff I wanted to tell you about. Uh, we're now all set to write, write down, now, we're now all set, set to return to physics. Maybe it's one more later, later. Uh, I, I wanted to tell you about extrinsic curvatures. Um, since we're doing geometry, I thought I would, but maybe later. Let's, 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 we'll come to that very soon. Okay, so um, now that we've got basic geometrical understanding of how to de deal with curved spaces, let's go back to physics, okay? I won't do any of the algebra of this lecture, we'll save that for the next lecture. But let's start with the idea. Do you remember that our, um, our philosophy was that what we're going to do is the following. We noted that we could write all the equations of physics, at least those that we tried. The geodesic equation, uh, Maxwell's equations, okay, uh, in flat space, in an arbitrary coordinate system. That, of course, is a triviality. What was sort of interesting was that we could write, write the equations without making specific reference to the coordinate system, entirely in terms of the metric in flat space. Then those equations made sense in when written uh, autonomously in terms of the metric in an arbitrary coordinate system, but also on an arbitrary manifold. So the idea that we, we, that we following Einstein came up with was to wonder what if the right rules for the world were that these equations of motion work in an arbitrary manifold. But then we, re we realized that, that if we, um, if those are the rules of the world, then we need dynamics for the metric on the manifold, right? In Lorentzian space, the metric was just given once and for all, it was eta, uh, and that, that was that. It was a particularly natural metric and was just postulated to be eta forever. Okay, and then we don't need any dynamics for what eta is, it's just eta forever. If, on the other hand, we're going to work with arbitrary metrics, either we're going to have to choose a distinguished metric as one, you know, one that God liked particularly when he made the universe, so this is the metric of the world, it seems very unnatural. I mean, we tried that with eta. Okay, if it's not going to be eta, it's probably not going to be anything. Or we need uh, dynamics for the metric itself. That was the idea that we, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we thought we would, we would try to implement. Okay. Now in physics, how do we make dynamics for a metric? Uh, how do we make dynamics for a field? We do that by, by writing down the action for the field. Okay. So what we want to do now is to try to write down, what we want to do now is to try to write down the action for the metric field. Okay, and how do we do that? So what is an action? So an action is an integral over something. But you know, we tied ourselves to being able to work in an arbitrary coordinate system. So whatever we write down should be coordinate invariant. 
Now, how do we make something that is an integral over space and time coordinate invariant? Well, we know there's only one way of doing it. That's by putting a, a factor of square root minus g here and multiplying it by some scalar. It's the only way of writing down a coordinate invariant integral over all of space. Okay. For the in the case of Max, the Maxwell equations, we we worked out in the first lecture what that scalar was. So f alpha beta, f alpha beta. We didn't even need to covariantize, you see, because in that case the gamma is cancelled because we were dealing with the form. Okay. But that was just the case of doing electromagnetism on a given background space. Now what we want to understand is what is the action that governs the dynamics of space-time itself. Okay? So what we need to do here is to put a scalar in the action that is built out of the metric itself. Now, what scalars do we have in our hands? Well, what about, mm, I don't know, determinant of the metric or something like that? Doesn't work, right? We've seen that it's not a scalar. In fact, it transformed in precisely the right way to make this times d dx. Any further dependence of the determinant of metric could make this non-coordinate. We need a genuine scalar. Now, we haven't yet encountered any genuine scalars. However, we have encountered a genuine tensor, namely R, A, B, C, D. Now, let's see what we can do to make what we can do to make genuine scalars out of that. So we have this object R, E, B, C, D. Remember, it was anti-symmetric in this, anti-symmetric in this, and symmetric under the integer. Interchange. Now, let's try to make a scalar. There are many ways we can make scalars. We'll explore some of these. But let's first try to make a scalar without taking any additional derivatives of this R. So what can we do? If we contract indices here, if we contract this index with this index, we get zero because it's anti-symmetric. By contracting, I mean contracting with a metric, okay, with an upper metric. Or this index with this index, we get zero. Of course, we could contract this index with this index. That is not zero. Okay? So, suppose we, do, we define the following. Suppose we define Rb. Suppose we take Rac is equal to Rabcdgbd. Okay. This is a possible nice two index object that we can work with. That's fine. It's still not a scalar. In order to make a scalar, we want to get rid of these two indices themselves as well. So we can contract these two indices as well. We can define a scalar, which is R, which is R A B C D G B D. G A C. This quantity is sometimes called the Ricci tensor. It's a two index entity. And this quantity is sometimes called the Ricci scalar. Okay. So one possibility for what to put in here would be there's another possibility for what to put in. Yeah. The, uh, okay, somebody could have suggested right at the beginning that, well, I can just put a constant. Let me call that a constant lambda. I could put a constant. Nobody could stop. Another thing I can do is put R. Okay? Now, there are many more things I can do. How can I do these additional things? For instance, I could build a scalar like this. R M N, R M N. That is a scalar. 
Another thing I could do was to take del A, del B of R, C, D, E, F, and then contract this in various kinds of pairs. Okay, contract indices appropriately, I won't even. Okay, so by putting, then I can take products of these things. There's zillions of scalars I could make. So, if I just want the most general or coordinate invariant scalar here, there's no end to it. I can write down any number of objects that I want. I need some sort of organizing principle to try to know what is natural. Okay? Now the organizing principle I'm going to use is an expansion in derivatives. You see, what you notice is that the simplest scalars that you can write down have the least total number of derivatives. So for instance, the scalar r, this quantity here, how many derivatives does it have? Two. Okay, because r, a, b, c, d is built out of two derivatives. Because gamma is one derivative, and a product of gammas, or derivative of gamma, each have two derivatives. Now, the metric tensor you should think of as a dimensionless object. Because the formula is dis distance square is metric tensor times coordinate times co di coordinate difference times coordinate difference. It's natural to have your coordinates in length of meters. Distance is length of meters. So the metric is dimensionless. So the dimension of this object is the same as the total number of derivatives in the object. The mass dimension of the object. So the mass dimension of the Ricci scalar is 2. The mass dimension of, let's say, this object is 4, same as total number of derivatives, and so on. So while we can write down an infinite number of scalars, uh, while we can write down an infinite number of scalars, the infinity in the number of scalars can be graded with respect to total number of derivatives. And if you fix to a particular number of derivatives, let's say 10 derivatives, there's a finite number of scalars you can write down. Right? You could just sit and enumerate them. Okay. Now, why is this grading important? This grading is important because if you have an action with terms of different dimensions, different numbers of derivatives, therefore different dimensions, then the relative parameters between different terms have to carry a length scale. Let us make a hypothesis. Okay? Let us make a hypothesis. That hypothesis is that there is a natural gravitational length scale. Let's call it the Planck scale. Okay? There's some natural length scale associated with gravity. Okay? And the key hypothesis is that that length scale is very small in units of interest to us. Let's say in millimeters or in nanometers or any, any units of interest to us. If we make that hypothesis, then let's, let's look at the relative importance of this term. Suppose I look at the relative importance of r plus r squared, r m n, r m n. This term, I'm not getting overall factors, right? I'm just get relative factors. Will have to be L p, this length scale, to the power two. Because r m n, r m n has two more derivatives than r has. Okay. And if there is, if the unique or the, even if there are many, all length scales associated with the gravity are small in units of interest for experiment, then you say that the contribution of this, so suppose we're looking at a process on scale delta x. What is an estimate of this quantity? It's one by delta x, the whole thing square because it's two derivatives. Is this clear? There's some problem. You're looking at the modeling of the solar system. There's a length scale associated with the solar system. It's the size of the solar system. 
Okay, the an estimate for that quantity in the solution of interest is one over the size of the solvent. What about let's try to make an estimate for this quantity? Well, you'll get L p squared divided by delta x going into the four. So if we assume that we are interested, if we if we assume that our delta x's are for the experiments we're going to for the, for the purposes we're going to use this 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 theory for is much much greater than L p, then this term is much much greater than this. Okay, so if we assume that the length scale associated with, the, with gravity um, is very small compared to all length scales of interest, okay, then that is uh, we should allow ourselves to focus on the lowest lowest dimension term, the term with the fewest number of derivatives, because all other terms would be very would be sort of negligible, okay compared to the others. Now firstly, you can ask, is there a natural length scale associated with gravity? And there is. Um, if you allow yourself to use, um, if you allow yourself to use Planck's constant, you can turn the d Newton's constant into a length scale. Planck's constant is the speed of light. You can turn Newton's constant into a length scale. You get a very, very small number. This Planck length of order 10 to the power minus 33 or something like that, centimeters. Okay? So there's a natural length scale associated with gravity if you allow yourself to use h bar. Okay? Uh, which is a very small number. So this seems like a reasonable assumption. So it sounds like we're, we're go going great. It sounds like we almost have a deductive procedure to, to guess what Einstein's action is. Except that if you follow this logic, you get the wrong answer. Because if you follow this logic, you would get the answer, the, the term with the lowest number of derivatives, and that's one. So, if you took my logic very seriously, you would argue that Einstein's action should be governed by square root g times one. You might argue that the next term in Einstein's action, if we want to keep the first correction, would be r. And then there would be higher order terms. Okay? So you might say that the Einstein's action should take the form this plus this, and then higher order terms. But anyway, it seems like an overkill to keep this at all. You should just keep this. Had that been the case, okay? Had that been the case, you would get basically trivial dynamics. Einstein was sort of pragmatic. His pragmatism was a bit different in different stages of his career. <laughs> but, uh, but in one particular stage of his career, he said, let's forget about this term. Let me suppose for some unknown reason. This term is not there. Okay. Then the gravitational action should be governed by square root g, square root minus g times, times r. Okay. This, as far as we can tell, for terrestrial size, solar system size, observations is the correct, gives you the correct ac action for gravity. And it's a magnificent thing. Dimensional analysis, derivative counting is almost working. However, it's not quite working because there is this irritating thing. That this object that we could also have written down and that should overwhelm dynamics, you know, does not re appear to be the leading term in dynamics. Now, as you all know, Developments over the last 100, year, 100 years, but especially over the last 15 years, 20, 20 years, have made it increasingly likely that such a term does exist in the gravitational action. It's called the cosmological constant. But the real miracle about this term is that it exists, but its magnitude is utterly tiny. You see, if I had used the same logic here, I would have estimated that this thing would have been 1 by LP square. However, in units of 1 by LP square, this quantity here is, I think, 10 to the power minus 120. This is very, very small. This is some, this fact 
the fact that we know from experiments that you know dimensional analysis is basically what you keep the two leading order terms in dimension counting and you seem to get more or less everything right but it sounds so strange because you see what this the fact that these two terms are comparable tells you that there is a length scale in the theory whose magnitude is roughly the size of the universe. However, there's another length scale in gravity given by Newton's constant. That's the, the Planck's length. So there is this huge hierarchy between two length scales that exist in the theory. This object here and the, 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 the Planckian length scale. And how it is, you know, what logic allows the universe to run with these two different length scales which are so widely separated, basically is just not understood. Okay, this, 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 is, this, this question is a question of what is called the cosmological constant. What string theorists like to call the problem of the cosmological constant. Um, this is a slightly more technical version of what I've said, but basically what I've said captures, captures the, the nuttiness of it. That dimensional analysis seems to work in suppressing R square. But that same analysis does not work in suppressing this compared to this. Seems for one term, namely the cosmological constant, somehow there is another length scale in the problem. But all other terms don't seem to see that. How and why and you know how this could work and how, especially when you add quantum mechanics to the story, this becomes increasingly puzzling. And is a central mystery in my opinion, of physics and of our world. The mystery can be worded in this, in this language. If there was one length scale for gravity, namely the length scale of the Planck scale, and the universe was curved, there's basically only one unit in which it could be curved, one unit for size in which it should be curved, which is um, the, the, the size is that Planck scale. So if you gave a string theorist back an envelope and told him that Newton's constant was this, well, estimate the size of the universe, depending on who, who he was, he might come up with a, things, a, a different factors of 100 or 200, but he would get more or less Planck scale. But it's an obvious fact that we don't live in a Planck scale universe. Why this is the case, we just don't understand. And in my opinion, is a central mystery about physics. That's for, for you guys, our generation, if you permit me to call myself in the same generation as you, <laughs> uh, to figure out. I'm just going to... In the rest of this course, we're just going to take this as given. Okay, that there is this additional extra term. It's very small for most purposes. If we're interested in solar size scale, scale physics, because this is like one over universe, length of universe squared, you can forget about this term. Okay, that these two terms capture gravity, but you know why that's the case? We just don't understand. We know it's true. We don't understand why it's true, and it's a great problem about physics. It's a problem about how it can be that the universe can be big and weakly gravitation, weakly coupled gravitation at the same time. You know, how those two can go together, there have been 60 years of discussion of this, essentially zero insight into that question. Okay, okay, the model systems which you understand because model systems are very high symmetric, symmetric or super symmetric. So that's very clear, but our, our world doesn't have that degree of super symmetry. So, I, the, so it's a great question, one that we will not talk about after, the, after this class. We will just go ahead and use this Lagrangian. For most of the course, we just take this term. When we're discussing cosmology, we'll add this term as well. And we'll proceed. But you should keep in the back of your mind that while this is pragmatic and it works, it's a mystery and one that needs to be cleared up. Okay? That's it. That's it. That's it.